morning that Francis Asbury, and we know God's Spirit, uh, fills this place and fills us as we gather together uh, and worship God. Today is uh, Super Bowl of Caring Sunday. We hear more about that uh, later in our service. It's also uh, the day that we're going to celebrate the Sacrament of Holy Communion. So uh, we look forward to this time of worship. Uh, we thank you for the ways that you have uh, supported uh, the Super Bowl of Caring by bringing uh, donations for Hominy Valley ABCCM, uh, food items uh, which are collecting in the Narthex, monetary um, donations, which that is our designated communion offering uh, for this morning, and also uh, safe and warm items, which ABCCM uh, throughout Buncombe County is, is facilitating that right now with uh, blankets and, and coats and hats and gloves to make sure that all of our neighbors are warm and cared for uh, this winter. You'll find in your bulletin opportunities for worship and service and discipleship here at Francis Asbury. Um, and our bulletin is filled with those opportunities. So hopefully the Spirit is nudging you to, to seek some of those out and participate. Uh, there's a table here in the Finley Room with some clipboards where you can uh, register, sign up for some of these. Uh, coming up uh, this week, we'll begin the season of Lent on Wednesday, which also happens to be February 14th and Valentine's Day. Uh, so what an interesting intersection of our calendars uh, this year. But uh, we're going to uh, have a meal, an Italian feast. Uh, our theme for Lent this year is meeting Jesus at the table. So we thought we're going to start at the table together. So I hope that you have let us know you're going to be coming to the table on Wednesday for uh, lasagna and salad and dessert and just wonderful fellowship. And then our service will be here in the sanctuary um, at 6.30 um, on Wednesday. As part of our uh, Lenten season, we'll also be uh, hosting a book study together. We're going to use the book called Meeting Jesus at the Table. So that'll start a week from tomorrow. Um, meet on the Mondays in Lent. So let me know if that's a group you'd like to join. We've got some books available uh, for you. Let's see. Also coming up this week, uh, the Fab Women are going to meet on Tuesday. And that information is in your bulletin. All women are welcome to come and to participate in that gathering. Um, on Thursday is our monthly uh, food pantry and market. That's from 3 to 5 in the gym, but it takes all day to, to set that up and prepare, and then um, we'll clean up when it's over. So if the Spirit has been nudging you to lend your time and abilities in helping us to, to feed and serve our neighbors, um, then let us know. We could, we could use your, um, your help on Thursday. Next Sunday, February 18th, uh, the Methodist men are going to have their uh, monthly breakfast and meeting at 7.30. Um, in worship, we are so excited that our lay leader and our newly certified lay speaker, Val Brush, will be our preacher um, next Sunday. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, also, um, at 1 o'clock, family fun this month is bowling. Uh, so we're going to meet at Skylanes at 1 o'clock. Uh, let us know if you're going to be uh, joining us. We'll make sure there's a, a space for you. Was that enough for, for next Sunday? Let's see. Our neighbors down the street, uh, St. Joan of Arc uh, Catholic Church, are also hosting a special event and performance um, next weekend. And the information is in the bulletin. They've invited us uh, to come and to join them and uh, participate in that special concert. So. Uh, you're available, then make plans to, to support our neighbors. Uh, there's other, other announcements here, other groups that are meeting, a, a women's Bible study that you can sign up for. Uh, the Spirit is, is moving in and among us, and so we're so grateful to be uh, in ministry together here at Francis Asbury. Let's join together in our call to worship. Come, let's praise God together. For God is great and worthy of our praise. <laughs> Let's tell stories of God's power and majesty, God's mighty acts throughout history. For God is great and worthy of our grace. Let's remember the compassion God has shown toward us, God's mercy and unfailing love, generation after generation. For God is great and worthy of our grace. Let's pass these stories along to our children and our grandchildren so that they too may come to know and love our God. For God is great and worthy of our praise. Let's worship God together. Please stand if you're able and join us in the welcome. Mm -hmm.
from Psalm 145, verses 1 through 9. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed, and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. Jesus said, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for such as these belongs to the kingdom. We remember those words that Jesus spoke when invite all of our young disciples to come up for a special time of sharing, and I think they have a special presentation for us today. that we have participated in for many years where our children and youth um, ask you to help support this cause. It goes to ABCCM. Um, we've raised a terrific amount over the years and so we ask for your support and encourage that. We've put together a little skit so we hope that our request hits home. And we just practiced this today. So, okay. Once upon a time, in the distant land of Las Vegas, Nevada, there were three people named Peter, James, and John, and they were living a dream. You see, they had tickets to the Super Bowl, and the tickets were on the 50-yard line. You can't imagine how excited these three men were. They were downright rallied with enthusiasm. They started punching each other in the arm in a manly way. Oh, oh, yeah. oh. Then they did the wave. <laughs> and back again. And then they did it five times in a row really fast. <laughs> Sat down. 
And just then, an amazing thing happened. You won't believe they blinked their eyes for a second and suddenly Super Can appeared before them. <laughs>
strength we pray with and for one another with the confidence that God hears us as we pray. Uh, that God draws near, near to us and responds to our prayers. Uh, you've seen our prayer list that goes out uh, as it does every week on Thursday and the names and the circumstances uh, for whom and with whom we are in prayer. Uh, members of our congregation, of our families and our communities. And I said she would add uh, one name to that list and that is uh, Brenda Massey. Brenda's the wife of Bob. And uh, Brenda's in the hospital right now dealing with a blood clot issue. So we want to offer prayers uh, for her and for her family and those who are offering uh, care for her. You might have other names and circumstances that are on your heart and your mind today. So we'll offer uh, a moment of silence for you to lift those names and circumstances to God. And then I'll offer a prayer for us together. Let us pray. God of grace, we thank you for this time and this space for worship. We praise you. We praise you for your goodness and for your mercy and for all the ways that you lead and guide us. You have created this world. You have asked us to be faithful stewards of it. You have commanded us to rest in it and to rest in your presence. As we rest in you today, as we connect with one another, we worship the one who draws us in and makes us new. God, in a world that becomes polarized and divided and conflicted, you ask us to be one, just as you are one, Father, Son, and Spirit. You invite us to break down barriers, to dispense with labels and stereotypes, and to focus on what is truly essential. We thank you for the tools that you give us. Scripture, the tradition of the church, and all those faithful leaders and teachers that have gone before us. Our own minds, with which you ask us to love you, and to think deeply, and to love one another. We know that we are not alone. We have the body of Christ, and we have your Holy Spirit that walks with us every day. As we pray together, we offer prayers of gratitude for the celebrations and joy you have sent. And as we pray, we offer our prayers of intercession for your children who suffer and struggle today, for all who are carrying heavy burdens and are concerned about tomorrow, we pray. This evening, as we prepare to enjoy a Super Bowl festivities and parties and the gatherings with feasts and fellowship, we are mindful that many in our community and millions in our country do not have enough to eat today. We remember that Jesus cared especially for the most vulnerable and called upon the faithful to express that same care. Forgive us, God, where we have not seen our neighbors or where we have turned away thinking that someone else would probably help instead. Please give us the mindfulness the strength and the vision to be the hands and the feet of Christ in our community. As we come today to your table, we come with open hands and we come with open hearts and with willing spirits. We know you give us the gift of grace, the gift of yourself. So nourish us in body and in spirit and send us out into neighborhoods, into community, into our schools, the places where we work, learn and play to be reflections of your image and your nature. Today, God, and in all the days to come, we open our spiritual and our physical eyes to look for signs of your kingdom that is coming here upon the earth. We pray in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord and who goes before us in every possible way, and he has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
as we continue in worship. We worship God uh, together as one body. We worship through prayer and through music and through uh, sacrament and through hearing God's word. And we also worship God by giving an offering, giving our tithes and our gifts, which is returning to God a portion of what God has first gifted to us and asked us to be good and faithful stewards of. We thank you for the ways that you give of your time and your talents and your resources generously and faithfully so that we can support and sustain uh, ministries of our church, but ministries and mission that flows uh, beyond us and beyond our walls out into our community and out into the world. Uh, we'll give our gifts this morning by passing the offering plates uh, up and down our pews, and we can always give our gifts um, into the wooden box that sits in our narthex and online through our church website. We'll invite the ushers to come.
Our second reading today is from the book of Galatians in the third chapter, verses 23 through 29. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So in case we hadn't noticed before, the young disciples reminded us that there is a big football game being played this evening. Uh, who is pulling for the Kansas City Chiefs today? <laughs> who is pulling for the San Francisco 49ers today? Oh, we've got even. This Josh should turn around because I know there's one back here. Okay, who is just watching for the commercials? <laughs> Who's not watching at all? <laughs> So we're, we're fairly distributed. But when we have a favorite team, there's really not a lot of middle ground, as we might have just heard in our congregation. There's just not a lot of middle ground when it comes to championships and rivalries. And if you had any question about that, ask one of the Duke or Carolina fans in our congregation. Nobody watching the Super Bowl tonight is hoping that it ends in a tie. There needs to be a clear winner, which means that then there must also be someone who loses the game. For as long as the Super Bowl has been played, there has never been a tie. In fact, only one Super Bowl game has ever gone into overtime. That was uh, Tom Brady and the Patriots that won that year. There have been a handful of football games uh, that, uh, that did end in a tie through the years, but the last time that happened was more than 80 years ago. It seems we just don't like ties, especially when it comes to sporting events, or elections, or board games, or any other competition. So we have tiebreakers. And that way, no fan has to buy a t-shirt after the game that says, sharer of the championship. <laughs> As humans, we employ what's called binary thinking. It's a way of thinking about things in terms of absolutes. Things are black and white. They're all or nothing. They're good or bad. They're right or wrong. It's Duke or Carolina. It's the Chiefs or the 49ers. It's an either or way of thinking. And there are times in our lives where that certainty, that clarity is helpful and it's desirable even. When we're driving down the road and we have to slam on the brakes to avoid a collision, our binary thinking helps us to make a, a fight or flight decision. It helps us prioritize safety and what we deem to be a simple and a correct and an efficient response. When we go to the doctor, we want clarity about test results and diagnoses. We don't want to sit in the doctor's office and hear them say, well, it might be your gallbladder or it might be your elbow. It's tough to say. <laughs> when a structural engineer signs off on a final inspection, we want them to have clarity that the building really does pass all the tests. We don't want to hear them say, well, those materials might be adequate. I suppose that structure will hold up under most types of pressure. We want clarity and we want certainty. But there are other times when that binary thinking is not helpful or it can actually be harmful. It has contributed to the ways that our human systems have become divided and polarized through time. 
It can also lead us to make sweeping generalizations about entire groups of people. But none of that is new. It's happened throughout human history, and I wonder if maybe every generation feels like the time in which they live might be more polarized and more divided than the generations that came before. That was the case in the 1700s when John Wesley lived and he served as a priest in the Church of England. This is the fifth and the final week in our Methodist Markers sermon series. So we've already talked about in our series John Wesley's concept of practical divinity. We've talked about our theological emphasis on grace. We've talked about our connectional structure. And last week we talked about our mission to follow Jesus, make disciples, and transform the world. Today we're considering how Methodists have historically been people who lived in the center. In the midst of two extremes, Methodists are those who have found a third way, or a center way. The Via Media, as it was called, actually started back with Queen Elizabeth and the Church of England. If you remember some of your uh, church history or British history from when you were back in school. But John Wesley found that this philosophy was not just helpful, but it was an essential part of Christians' ability to listen and to discern and to build relationships with each other. When it comes to the life of faith and our understanding of God, we cannot always use our binary thinking, and we should not always use our binary thinking. There is a mystery that surrounds God that surpasses our human understanding. And what's more, we, we don't want to become so entrenched in our beliefs that we do more harm than we do good. Sometimes I've, I've observed that we determine what we think and, and who we are and what we trust and believe in by determining what we're against. And I'm not sure that's always helpful. I'm not sure that's always healthy. And I'm not sure that's Christ-like. In his letter to the Galatian churches, the Apostle Paul has a message for them about unity. Even then, there was some discord among members of the church. And what was happening is as new people were coming to faith, and they were coming into the church, uh, they were being told by rival teachers and missionaries what they had to do, and they were getting different reports. So some of the teachers were telling them, you have to be rigid in keeping Jewish law. That means you have to be circumcised. That means you have to keep festivals and laws about food. You need to pay really special attention to all these things. And it was confusing, and it was causing conflict. And Paul's response to this was to say, well, that's not the case. We are now all under the same covenant. We all follow the same Christ, and we all receive the same righteousness. Biblical scholars believe that this section that we heard in our worship today from chapter 3 was a liturgy. And liturgy is like a script for religious service. It's ritual or something formal that we participate in when we worship together, like our prayers or our creeds or our songs or the special service that we have when we celebrate the sacraments. So it's believed that, especially verses 27 through 29, were a particular liturgy that they read at a service of baptism. So we can imagine a baptism happening somewhere in the region of Galatia, probably was at a river or a lake. And imagine the person being baptized coming up out of the water, and this is what they heard. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free, male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. You all share in this promise, and you are all one. And at the moment that they're baptized, all these labels that other people have assigned to them fall away, and they're irrelevant. Paul says they don't matter. God doesn't play favorites. This either-or that the world has created is not part of the kingdom of God. Or as, as one pastor says, it's a kingdom full of ties, as they served the church and led the Methodist movement, John and Charles Wesley found a way to, to teach this and to preach this and found a way to live in the center. 
And that doesn't mean that they compromised on everything. They certainly didn't compromise on the most important things. If you read John Wesley's journals, I think he was a rather stubborn person. <laughs> Methodists have always held to Orthodox Christian beliefs and doctrine. We believe in the Trinity and the Incarnation and the Resurrection. We believe in grace and sin and the Bible is the inspired Word of God. And we believe that the church is the body of Christ on earth and all those other statements that are in our creeds. But we also acknowledge that not everything is as important as those things that are listed in our creeds. We, um, we acknowledge that when it comes to our faith, not everything is black and white. Sometimes we find gray area, and that's okay. We humans don't fit into a box, and neither does God. In his wisdom, John Wesley followed the approach in the essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity or love. In the essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, love. We could survey our congregation today and we could find that we're not all of one mind. Well, we've kind of already done that, haven't we? We all come from different backgrounds. We have different experiences and abilities and desires and preferences. And that probably means that we're going to take certain passages of Scripture and we're not going to interpret them in the same way. It means we have different preferences on traditions and on music that we enjoy. It means that we might be passionate about different uh, issues of justice and outreach. It means that when we go to the polls to do our civic duty, we're not all going to vote the same way. It means that when we go home and, and turn on the TV tonight, we're not going to pull for the same team. And yet, we are part of the body of Christ together. We agree on the essentials. We share one mission. We are committed to praising God and growing spiritually and reaching neighbors. And we're part of a denomination that's passionate about its mission to follow Jesus, make disciples, and transform the world. In John Wesley's day, as groups were becoming more polarized and people were pulling to one extreme or the other, he started to apply this middle way. And in his fellow clergy were debating over things like, like faith and works. Which one is it? Is, are we saved by faith? Are we saved by works? John Wesley said, yes to both. He said we can't have either one by itself. We don't do good works in order to be saved. He said we do good works because we are saved. When different factions would argue about whether it was personal holiness or social holiness, John Wesley found the third and the center way again. He would say our faith is personal, yes. There's this conversion that happens within us. God does something within us. And yet, we don't live out our faith in private or alone or in isolation. We, we take our faith and we live it publicly. We demonstrate God's transforming work and we do it by engaging with and serving our neighbors. When people started arguing about whether it was religion or science, Wesley argued again for a third way. He said, our faith uses our reason. Wesley believed in reading and studying and using his mind, and he made sure all his preachers did the same. Methodists still believe that living in the center means science and religion are not at odds with each other. In fact, we believe that they inform and complement each other. As Paul would say, it's not either or, it's both and. Even in our structure, Methodists have found the center way between two extremes. Some churches are uh, congregational in their structure, which means that the authority in a church is, is grassroots, it's bottom up. And those churches are independent and self-governed. They hire their own clergy. Other churches are Episcopal in structure. That means their authority is more of a top-down structure. They have a hierarchy that includes People like bishops or archbishops, maybe a pope. And clergy receive and churches guidance from those higher-ups. 
And that's where clergy assignments are made. United Methodists don't fall into either of those categories. Our middle way is we're connectional. Our system combines the strengths of those autonomous churches, but the way that the um, Episcopal ones are so connected around the world. We talked two weeks ago about how clergy and legacy have equal voices in the United Methodist Church and at conferences, as delegations, and in the local church. In the local church, the pastor doesn't make uh, unilateral decisions, and neither does the lay leader or the church council. We work together. United Methodists make decisions in conference. You've heard us talk about going to conference. We discuss and we debate and we discern and we determine together. In our denomination, we don't have a CEO or an executive committee or a single presiding bishop. When our general conference gets together, uh, as they will later this year, the delegates are our clergy and laity from around the world, and our bishops preside at that meeting, but they do so without a vote. In the United Methodist Church, our clergy also itinerate. That means that we move from church to church. In the earliest days, uh, the pastors did that by horseback. I'm kind of glad that that has shifted. <laughs> but as Belton Joyner uh, has once said, John Wesley believed that those itinerant preachers that moved uh, from place to place were more effective than the ones that settled in, grew comfortable, and wore out what they had to say. Still today, clergy do move from church to church, are appointed for a season. The assignments are made by our bishop, but in consultation with clergy, with staff parish relations committee. Um, we know that there's not a perfect system, but we trust that those assignments, those matches are made by listening to the Holy Spirit and by listening to local churches, considering what their needs are, and considering gifts and the well-being of clergy, too. The body of Christ is so diverse. It's filled with people of different talents and experiences and backgrounds and thoughts and preferences and languages and ethnicities and genders and time periods. We are many and yet we are one all at the same time. And that's not a simple calling. Sometimes Methodists have, have faithfully lived out that call to find the center and other times in our history, we have become divided and we've had to find our way again by renewal and by unification in the church. But the middle way is an important part of who we are. It's, it's in our roots. It's scriptural. And maybe in this time, in this season, maybe we can come back to, refocus on John Wesley's invitation to live as disciples that are united in essentials, respectful when it comes to non-essentials, and loving in all things. When we live and we act that way, we're, we're a church that's embodying what Paul talks about in Galatians 3. We don't let those non-essential things divide us. We don't put people into boxes with labels and stereotypes, and we offer grace and hospitality. At our annual conference last year, all of the delegates who went to Lake Junaluska for the Western North Carolina Conference were given a, a copy of a book that our bishop had written and published. Um, it's called Unrelenting Grace by our bishop, Ken Carter. And in the book, he reminds us about some of the things we've talked about in this sermon series, what makes us uh, unique as Methodists. He talks about grace and holiness and connection and he helps us to look forward with hope, especially after a season of, of pandemic and conflict. But in the book, he also tells a personal story, and I've, I've heard him tell this um, in other places as well. But he tells about how he came to be a United Methodist. He grew up in South Georgia, and as a boy, his family uh, was part of a church of a different denomination. And when he was in middle school, his parents got divorced. And for a while, his mother took the kids, and they continued attending that same church, uh, where his grandparents' names were on the stained glass window and had been their spiritual home and support for so long. But in 
But one day, a couple of people in the church took his mother aside and strongly suggested to her that it might be best if their family found another place to go to church. As you might imagine, that was hurtful. And for a while, um, they didn't have a church. They left the place that had been their spiritual home. But then one of his mother's friends said, how about you come with me to the place where I go to church? And it happened to be the United Methodist Church in town. And so their family went and began attending in a new place where they were welcomed and loved and shown grace. And the essentials unity and the non-essentials liberty and all things love. Today we are invited to the Lord's table to receive the gift of grace that was poured out. Not just for some, but for all. For men and for women, for rich and for poor, for old and for young, for people who hadn't been born yet, for sinners, for humankind. In our baptism, we are heirs of that promise and that covenant that was made. We're part of the body. And we are commissioned to be part of God's transforming work in the world. Thanks be to God. we come to the Lord's table today, we'll follow the liturgy that will be on the screen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth or you had formed the earth from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and you breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. So with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. In his baptism and in table fellowship, Jesus took his place with sinners. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce at the time to come when you would save the people. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he took a loaf of bread. He gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took a cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. It is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim together the mystery of faith. Christ is God. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us who are gathered here, 
and all these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ so that we can be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at his heavenly banquet table. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all oh, honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Please stand as you're able and join us in our closing hymns and forth by God's blessing.